Bruchem Aboyim, again, welcome to, welcome to our house. Um, this week, on my thoughts, I would like to examine the question, <clears throat> are we truly able to emphasize or criticize another person if we have not experienced their pain and suffering? You know, Hillel stated in Pirkei Avos in the Ethics of the Fathers, do not condemn your fellow man until you have stood in his place. They tell a story of Reb Nachman of Chernobyl. He spent much of his time and efforts on the mitzvah of what we call Pidyon Shvuyim, redeeming Jews who are incarcerated, at one of the most important mitzvahs in the Torah. You can even sell a safer Torah for it. So it was not uncommon for Jewish innkeepers <clears throat> to be beaten and thrown into dungeons for not being able to pay their rent to their non-Jewish landowners. Reb Nachman would uh, do whatever he could to pr procure their release. He hoped to save them from the pain and the agony of being imprisoned, which sometimes even included their families. It happened that one time, Reb Nochem found himself in prison. He knew that nothing that happens in our lives is an accident, so he wondered, why would God Almighty want him to be a prisoner? Well, he voiced his question to one of his illustrious Hasidim, his students, who had come to visit him. The Hasid told him, Rebbe, Maybe God orchestrated that you should be a prisoner so that you could experience firsthand what it feels like to, to, to wallow in a dark and dungeon prison, not certain of your fate. He said, Rebbe, though you spend much time and effort trying to help others, just maybe, just maybe now that you have personally experienced what it feels like to be a prisoner, you may do the mitzvah with even more effort and alacrity. He nodded and accepted what this chassid told him. It happened that later that night, he just happened to lean on the door to his cell, and it opened. And so he began to walk through the prison, and somehow, every one of the guards was asleep. He walked right out the front door and never turned back. He had learned a valuable lesson. You know, we read in the Torah in the opening verse in the portion of Lech Lecha, that God tells Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, Lech Lecha, he tells him to leave his land, leave his birthplace, leave his father's house, and to travel to the place where he, God, would show him. The timing, if you think about it, really seems strange. This command from God came shortly after the incident where Nimrod had thrown Avramvinu into a fiery furnace. Avramvinu survived unscathed by the flames, though his brother Harun, who was also thrown into the same furnace, died. As you can imagine, he was famous. He was a superstar. One would have thought that God Almighty would have wanted him to stay in his hometown. After all, this populace had witnessed his miraculous salvation. He had credibility. But somehow instead, God told him to travel to a faraway place where he was basically unknown. The question is why? Abram Vino, Abraham, our father, was, so to speak, the first Howard Johnsons. He specialized in the mitzvah of extending hospitality to wayfarers, people that were traveling on the road that needed a place to rest and have a meal before they continued on their journey. God instructed Abravino to first become a wayfarer himself so that he would experience firsthand the difficulties of the road. His firsthand experiences are what contributed in making him such a more effective and gracious host. He understood the travails of the road. He could therefore address the needs of his guests without them even saying a word, since he himself had experienced what being a wayfarer entailed. You know, I have a dear friend who's very righteous. He's a very righteous individual. He makes every effort to perform every each and every mitzvah to the best of his ability, even, and even though he would attend funerals and visit the house, houses of mourners, his words of solace came from his mouth, not his heart. But then, sadly, he lost a parent. While he was sitting shiva in New York City, a group of us decided to drive to New York City in order to offer our condolences and to comfort him on his loss. He was visibly moved by our action and concern. After he finished his state of mourning, 
I notice a change in his reaction to those who were experiencing the loss of a loved one. He now even made it a point of traveling to other cities so as to be able to comfort other mourners. His words of consolation <clears throat> no longer came from his lips. They now visibly came from his heart. His own deep loss made him appreciate the loss that other mourners felt. Theory and reality are not the same thing. He was now able to actually be Menachem Oval, bringing comfort to those who suffered the loss of a loved one. Those who that so desperately need someone <clears throat> who can understand the pain that they are experiencing and share in their loss. You know, when God Almighty offered the Torah to the Jewish nation at Mount Sinai, they said the Hebrew words, Na'asev v'nishma, we will do, and then we will listen. Our sages interpret these words to mean that though the children of Israel are referred to as an Am Kishay Oref, a stiff-necked people, a nation that accepts nothing at face value, yet they accepted the Torah, sight unseen, no questions asked. They went against their nature, meaning that wherever you have two Jews, then you have at least three different opinions. I read more into these two words spoken by the nation as they stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. <clears throat> I think that these words tell us that if you want me to nishma, if you want me to listen, then you first have to assay. You first have to do. Book knowledge? Well, it's important and even necessary, but it cannot compare to first-hand life experiences. You know, before my mother of blessed memory passed away, I had a silly thought. I thought that someday, in the future, she would pass on to the next world. And that I, growing up in the macho age, where men didn't cry, I would just stand there stone-faced, not even shedding a tear. Well, sadly, the day came much quicker than I wanted or expected. My mother passed away. On that day, hmm, all of my theories vanished before my eyes. I cried like a baby. I had lost the one person in life who loved me more than anyone or anything else could. I was totally devastated. Well, so much for theory. I have been blessed in my life that I have not been subjected to any real serious illness. I make it a point to wish those who suffer from painful and long-term illnesses a complete and speedy recovery. However, though I try to truly connect to their pain, it is difficult to truly appreciate how being sick can affect every facet of your life. Well, it happened this year during the 10 days of tshuva, the 10 days of repentance between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I contracted a cold. Well, it was only a cold, but it dominated my life for a few days. I found it difficult to concentrate on anything. I was miserable. I told myself that it was only a cold and that I shouldn't allow it to dictate my thoughts or my actions. <laughs> well, good luck with that. It did take over my mind, and it did take over my body. It is sad but true that we have a tendency to take many of our daily blessings for granted. As states in Pirkei Avos, the Ethics of the Fathers, Ben Zoma asked the question, Ezer hu asher, who is a rich person? The Hebrew word asher is spelled ayin, shin, yud, resh. These letters comprise an acronym for four things, enayim, your eyes, Shinayim, your teeth, Yodayim, your hands, and Raglayim, your feet. If a person is not healthy, well, they can have all the money in the world, and yet they are still poor. Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, asked God to bring sickness into the world. Well, this seems like a strange request. You see that he understood that though it is preferable that we connect to God, our father, through happiness and joy, well, in reality, we are more apt to turn to him through pain and sickness. As the saying goes, there's no atheist in a foxhole. We take, more often than not, we take our good health for granted. It is sickness that motivates us to reach out to God, a wake-up call, that reminds us that there is a God in the world and that we all have the, an obligation to thank him daily for our good health and all the other blessings that he bestows upon us. We are told by our sages that during the high holidays, God Almighty decides whether we will experience good health 
or sickness in the upcoming year. That being the case, the question becomes, why is it that we say three times daily in our weekday Amida, the standing prayer, that we ask God to cure us from any illness? You know, when you pray to God for good health while you are still healthy, in reality, you're asking him to move a pebble. However, if you wait to ask him for good health once you are already sick and infirm, well then, you are asking him to move a boulder, a request which is much more difficult to attain. If you are or have been sick, you now have the knowledge and ability to pray for someone else who is suffering from an illness. You can do so with much more kavana, with true and sincere feelings. As the saying goes, words from the heart go to the heart. Many times, just the realization that other people are concerned about your welfare already makes you feel better. In fact, our sages tell us that when you go and visit a sick person, you have the ability of removing one sixtieth of their illness. You know, a couple of years ago, my wife and I contracted COVID for the first time. Well, this occurred during the last days of the holiday of Sukkot. As expected, we sequestered ourselves for the holiday. I found that not having anyone, any contact with other people me, during those days of the Yomtev somehow made the sickness even worse. If you ever watched as someone accidentally cuts their finger, you cringe, even though it's not your finger that was being cut. Somehow, you connect with that action and it evokes an involuntary emotional response. You know, we should try to generate the same feelings of compassion whenever we witness anyone who is suffering, any pain or discomfort. It is much like the story of an older couple that went to see a doctor. It seemed that the wife was suffering from a fall that she had taken. Her husband told the doctor that we are suffering from a pain in our side. There's a saying that people use, I feel for you, but I just can't reach you. We need to train ourselves to not only feel for other people's difficulties in life, we also need to reach out to them and let them know that they are not alone in their moment of distress. Though we may not want to ever be sick, we need to realize that there is nothing that God Almighty has brought into this world that doesn't have a positive purpose. We need to thank God for our good health before we are sick. However, we need to reach out to others, especially those with long-term illnesses, and try to truly help them to accept all that God gives us in life though we may not understand exactly why. And there's a story told of a man who was suffering with a long-term illness, and a great rabbi came to visit him. As you can imagine, the man complained bitterly to the rabbi about his condition. The rabbi said to him, I envy you. <laughs> well, the sick person was surprised by his response. He asked the rabbi, Why would you envy me? And the rabbi said, Let me tell you a story. You see, there was a man who had suffered greatly in life, and when he died, he stood in front of the heavenly court. They examined all of his deeds, and they concluded that his, his sins outweighed his merits, and that he should be sent to purgatory. The defending angel said to the court that this individual had suffered greatly, and shouldn't his suffering be taken into account? Well, the court agreed. And they told the angel to place all of his sufferings on the scales of justice. The angel did so, and the scale began to move up bit by bit. But it could not override all of his sins. As the individual was being led off to purgatory, he cried out to God, Why couldn't you have made me suffer just a little bit more? The rabbi told the sick man, All of your suffering may well be the ticket that gets you into paradise. So we all need to look at our suffering in this world as a wake-up call, a message from our benevolent Father in Heaven, who is trying to help us gain entry into an eternity of paradise. No experience in life is accidental. Everything that occurs has a deeper and more profound purpose. We need to connect to the pain and suffering of our brothers and our sisters in the land of Israel. We need to pray for their safety. We need to comfort those who have lost loved ones, we need to pray for the safe return of the hostages and for the safety of the IDF. This moment in time cannot be an accident. Let us all hope that this is a wake-up call for the coming of the Messiah. 
You know, when Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, came to Egypt to redeem the children of Israel from their oppressive slavery, he told them the words that Yosef had told over to the elders before he died. Yosef told them that the Redeemer of Israel would come one day. As proof that he was sent by God Almighty, the Redeemer would cite these Hebrew words, pokod, pokadati, meaning that I will surely redeem you. Now the gematria, the numerical value of these two words is 784. Again, nothing is an accident. We have just entered into the Hebrew year, 5,784. This is in addition to this being the secular year 2023. 2023 was the year counting from the creation of the world that God Almighty told Adam Ravino, Abraham our father, to Lech Lecha, to leave his home and to go to the land of Israel. And with that, let us hope and pray that this is the year that God Almighty will instruct all Jews throughout the world to Lech Lecha, to return to our homeland, the land that was promised to our forefathers with the coming Mashiach Sukenu. Quickly, may it happen now. Again, let me thank you again for attending and for listening. And again, please remember to pray and to donate and to do whatever you can in any small way. We're all one people, one nation, one thought, one body. What hurts your toe hurts you. Anything that happens in Israel should affect all of us. And let's pray for our brethren and pray for ourselves and Mashiach should come. Thank you again very much for listening and to Shabbat Shalom. And please let me also mention that please stay tuned for an original song again that I wrote that I do after this class every week. Again, thank you very much for attending. God bless and be well.